member of the, okay, there you go. He is a founding member of the uh, Texas Cosmology Center. He's published over 200 papers in theoretical astrophysics. He is in the chair line of the Division of Astrophysics and of the American Physical Society. And when he was given that position, or he, when he earned that position, the citation read, for outstanding contributions to astrophysics and cosmology, which advanced our understanding of cosmic reionization, structure formation, gas dynamics, dark matter, and dark energy, interstellar and intergalactic media, and topics uh, for, from supernova polarization to relativistic shocks. He's won awards from the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, Fellowship in, America, um, in, Amer in Physics, uh, UT's Astronomy Teaching Excellence Award, National Chair of Excellence for the uh, Universidad Nacional Atoma de Mexico, and UT's John W. Cox Fellowship for Advanced Study in Astronomy. So with that, I would like to turn it over to our distinguished speaker, Paul Shapiro. Thank you uh, very much. Um, and thank you for having me. Um, I, uh, when I was asked by uh, the organizers of the meeting to um, give this talk, uh, of course, it, I knew right away that I had to do it and it was a great honor to be asked to do it. But I also knew that it would be a, a mixture of sadness and uh, also a daunting thing to be able to do justice. Uh, the, uh, we in Texas uh, know the uh, song, um, the, uh, the, um, the stars uh, at night are big and bright deep in the heart of Texas. But in July of this summer, uh, those stars uh, became much dimmer uh, at the loss of our uh, great Steven Weinberg, uh, professor of physics at the University of Texas for the last 40 years. And so I'm going to give you a very personal account uh, of various things about him uh, in especially uh, going to focus on my overlap with him and my uh, privilege to have been not only his friend and his colleague, uh, but his student and then uh, his collaborator, um, and also to have performed with him in the audience. So I have so many stories that I could tell, but time will be short. So let me get to the what I can. Um, and uh, I, I'm supposed to acknowledge that we're being recorded, which I just did. Okay. So, um, uh, you know, okay. Now, as I tell you the remembrances of uh, Steve, uh, of course, uh, a Steve was always in a close binary, as we say in astronomy. Um, very devoted, long marriage uh, to his partner in life, Louise Weinberg. I'll say more about her as I tell a little bit about their lives uh, as they uh, went through them together. And um, I will then uh, uh, circle back. Um, the early years. Uh, Steve was born in 1933 in the Bronx, New York City to Frederick and Eva Weinberg, a court stenographer and homemaker. He was a child of the Great Depression. A chemistry set inherited from a cousin sparked his early interest in science. Uh, he was in the class of 1950 at New York City's elite Bronx High School of Science Magnet School. Um, according to Weinberg, students there took an unusual approach to gaining popularity. Because the school didn't offer calculus, it was common for students to teach themselves. It was cool in this school to, on your own, Learn calculus, Weinberg said. That's how you got social credit. They taught each other physics too, as Steve did with future particle physicist Sheldon Glashow, with whom he later shared his 1979 Nobel Prize. Their first collaboration was at Bronx High School of Science and also with Gerald Feinberg. 
In the college years, having grown up in New York City, Weinberg said he did not want to attend a college in an urban environment and chose to attend Cornell University. Uh, I wanted grass, and I don't mean marijuana, Weinberg said, uh, in a news and views uh, broadcast of uh, KUT, uh, interviewing him in front of a packed audience. It was there at Cornell where I met Louise Goldwasser, whom I fell in love with long before she fell in love with me. Louise, now Weinberg's wife, decided to stay in New York while Weinberg completed his doctorate degree at Princeton University. I really still think I have the record of the fastest PhD there, Weinberg said. I got it in a year and a half. I did the worst thesis probably in their history, but the most important thing is that I rejoined Louise. Now, to be fair, his PhD thesis under Princeton's legendary physics teacher, also physicist, Sam Treeman, was on weak decays and renormalization, subjects he apparently learned at some point, after all, despite its shortcomings. Um, and I have to say that um, what I heard in terms of the uh, issue of finishing in Princeton was that Louise basically took one look at Princeton and said, I'm out of here, and went back to live with her parents uh, and told Steve, uh, you know, you're, you're free to join me when you're done. Meanwhile, somewhere between these moves, I thought it was after grad school, apparently it was between, um, Steve and Louise spent a year in Copenhagen. And I've heard stories about how in those days one could buy a plane ticket to circumnavigate the globe before their return. You can't buy such a ticket open-ended now. Before Texas, the wonder years. Weinberg next held faculty positions at Columbia, where I believe he did not get tenure, then UC Berkeley, then MIT, and then Harvard. When Weinberg moved across town from MIT to Harvard, circa 1973, great excitement rippled through the halls of Harvard physics, where as an undergrad, I first learned of his existence, the wunderkind referred to then as little Stevie Wonder. By then, recognition of his work on the theory of the electroweak interaction was finally becoming secure. It was several years since his most famous Nobel Prize winning paper, A Model of Leptons, 1967, had appeared, but only a couple since it was taken seriously. Earlier in the 60s, his old schoolmate Sheldon Glashow and Abdul Salam had proposed, proposed to unify electromagnetism and the weak nuclear force responsible for radioactive decay by proposing massive W and Z bosons as force carriers but giving them mass made the theory non-renormalizable. In his 1967 paper, Weinberg was the first to show in three pages that spontaneous symmetry breaking could be applied to the weak interaction, leading the W and Z bosons to appear to be massive at lower energies. It was not cited at all in its first two years and only recovered from neglect after a 1970 paper by Gerard Tuft showed that such a theory was renormalizable. Steve told me over dinner once that it was only after he took it upon himself to write to Etuft to point out that his paper had anticipated this result and that to his credit, Etuft checked it out and acknowledged it publicly that Steve's paper came to be known and accepted as significant. It is now one of the most highly cited and influential papers in the history of physics. Weinberg next held faculty positions. Oh, I've, I, I, sorry, I'm doubling back. Um, in, um, I was a first year graduate student at Weinberg's quantum field theory class at Harvard in the fall of 90, 1974, just about the time the first experiments verified a prediction of the electroweak theory, now known as Weinberg Salam theory, when neutral currents and neutrino scattering were discovered at CERN involving the exchange of Z bosons. Steve started class one day with the good news. If my memory is correct, he said he had just heard it from a colleague, Helen Quinn. Helen Quinn figures in at least two other important developments with Weinberg as well in that time frame: A paper by Howard Georgie Quinn and Weinberg on grand unified theories or guts as they are now referred to uh, in phys red letters attempted to unify the three forces of quantum physics, electromagnetic, weak and strong forces. Um, uh, Weinberg's response to a 1977 paper by Peche and Quinn, 
proposing to resolve the strong CP violation problem in the strong interaction as described by the theory known as quantum chromodynamics or QCD by postulating a new global symmetry that becomes spontaneously broken. Um, Weinberg uh, realized in a paper in 1978 that this would imply the existence of a new massive particle now we call the axion, uh, which would have been produced in the early universe and is a leading candidate for the mysterious dark matter that pervades the universe today. Um, uh, before we leave uh, the uh, wonder years, um, the uh, 70s uh, as they came to a close and Weinberg continued to do his part in constructing what we now know as the standard model of elementary particle physics was awarded the 1979 Nobel Prize shared with Glashow and Salam as I believe we as students in that period simply assumed would happen and it did. Some experimental confirmations of the electroweak theory were still to come, of course. Weinberg accurately predicted the masses of the W and Z bosons, which were discovered at CERN in the 1980s. His theory had also predicted the existence of a new particle, the Higgs particle, which was finally discovered at the LHC in 2012. There's much more to report. And fortunately, professors Cavedo and Raisin will speak later also about Weinberg and do better justice to his extraordinary scientific legacy and quantum field theory and other aspects. But time limits me and I wanna give Steve, get Steve onward to Texas and share my direct interactions with him in the field of cosmology. Um, meanwhile, Louise Weinberg was also pursuing her academic career as a law professor and the rumor mill circulated a notion at that time that Steve had declared that the next career move was going to be hers. And so it was in 1980 that when the law school at UT Austin made her an offer of a professorship, someone had the brilliant insight to court Steve and bring them both. I know this firsthand because that was the year I received an offer of an assistant professorship in the astronomy department at UT. And those ripples of excitement I remembered at the news that Weinberg was moving to Harvard while I was a student there were but a small precursor of the even greater excitement I felt at the news that he would move to UT at the very same time I would. There were already distinguished things going on at UT and famous people to join. For example, the Senator of Relativity had uh, John Archibald Wheeler and Bryce DeWitt and many others of distinction. Gerard de Vaucouleur, the famous astronomer was in the astronomy department. At the same time, by some magical coincidence or convergence, Marshall Rosenbluth, the world's, world's leading plasma physics theorist, was also going to join the physics department and build a new group and a fusion theory institute, which had just been funded by the NSF. I knew that too firsthand because I was a postdoc at this time at Princeton's Institute for Advanced Study, just down the hall from Marshall Rosenbluth and his uh, group. Uh, when the deal was struck. But Steve's move was by far the biggest news. Um, so we come to Texas. Uh, during his time in Texas, I don't have time to do justice to it, but uh, Steve, uh, from the time that he arrived for my calendar, it was the spring of 1981, although officially he's said to have joined in 1982, um, he built a new theory group um, from scratch, although there were well-known theorists like Sudarshan already here, this was the Weinberg theory group. Um, the uh, Weinberg theory group has on its website a statement of its purpose. The work done by the theory group ranges from physics at the most fundamental level to computations relevant to current observations in particle physics and cosmology. And Weinberg was a professor of both physics and astronomy and his teaching and research span both fields and departments. Um, and now I'm going to use the remainder of my time to give you just a few bars from Weinberg's Cosmology Symphony, just a few of the many things for which I am grateful. And uh, some of these are on the slides and some of them are not on the slides and time will run out. So I have to be judicious in how much I share. But first, as a Harvard undergraduate, I took Steve's two semester course on general relativity and cosmology, taught from his monumentally important 1972 book, Gravitation in Cosmology, 
written just a few short years after the 1965 discovery of the cosmic microwave background, put the Big Bang model on firm footing. As a first year graduate student, uh, where I remained at Harvard there, I took Steve's quantum field theory course. He handed out a few terse pages of handwritten lecture notes, which he said were the beginning of a textbook he was writing. I am sure he really meant it because about 20 years later, he finished volume one in 1995 of his monumentally important three volume textbooks, The Quantum Theory of Fields. This was Steve's modus operandi for the next three decades as well. He taught a new course whenever he wanted to write a new book. By teaching, he taught himself the subject, learning it more deeply than he or anyone else had before, turning it into another legacy book, then moving on to a fresh challenge, a new subject, a new class, and a new book. And what a legacy it is. Of course, I said already about the quantum theory of fields. But in 1977, even before this uh, fruitful period uh, in Texas, uh, Steve had already uh, written a groundbreaking popularization of the Big Bang uh, cosmology, uh, the first three minutes translated in many countries, uh, languages of many countries around the world. I won't say more about it. Um, recently, um, in more recently, I should say, um, his long standing interest in the history of physics and the history of science in general and the development of uh, the intellectual uh, definition of what we call modern physics, uh, which he traces forward to Isaac Newton uh, is, was in this uh, uh, very well received uh, historical uh, book to explain the world. Um, in uh, 2008, uh, not content to have written the 1972 book, he felt the need to uh, teach himself all about the things that had been going on in cosmology in the last uh, 20 years when his attention had been on other matters uh, where uh, his interest in astrophysics as a hobby uh, had always been strong, but his uh, professional engagement in the details of what the cosmology revolution was doing um, had um, diminished. And that wasn't like uh, Steve. So he recognized that a revolution was going on and he had to get into it. So uh, again, he said, I'm gonna teach the course. I'm gonna learn it all. I'm gonna write the book. And he did. And in the process, he made many more fundamental contributions. I won't have time to tell you about them. Um, the books, just to show you the pictures, his most recent um, that I was familiar with were uh, a long standing interest he had in writing about the astrophysics that every physicist wanted to know but was afraid to ask, lectures on astrophysics. But I can just page through uh, the books. Uh, one, Dreams of a Final Theory. Um, was one of his first ventures into this um, more uh, philosophical, intellectual uh, book writing. Um, but um, as I studied the many books, and uh, I cannot tell you how surprised I was to learn how many there were that I did not know about, I came upon one which impressed me especially. And that was a book written during the uh, George W. Bush years, uh, that he wrote called Glory and Terror, The Growing Nuclear Danger. And I just want to read to you this. Boy, I'm going to run out the clock, but I started a little late, so I hope you'll be patient with me. I just want you to read this, and then I'll skip forward. Stephen Weinberg, the Nobel Prize winning physicist, writes that America today, quote, has an unprecedented opportunity to begin to escape from the risk of nuclear annihilation. But he warns, President Bush is not only letting his, this opportunity slip away, he is, in some respects, moving in the wrong direction. Bush's abrogation of the 1972 treaty limiting anti-ballistic missile systems is one example. Uh, another equally worrying is the, quote, revival of the idea of developing nuclear weapons for use rather than solely for deterrence. The development of low yield earth penetrating nuclear weapons and so on. Now, let me skip forward. Uh, I think I, I, I can't do it justice, but I, I want this to be an example 
of, uh, although Steve did spend an earlier part of his career as a member of Jason, the sort of elite think tank of, uh, of uh, physicists and scientists like him uh, consulting uh, for the US government, but he became disenchanted with this on the uh, on issues like uh, nuclear uh, disarmament. Um, but he was not only outspoken about that. Weinberg was a public atheist, an intellectual public atheist. He stated his views on religion in 1999. Um, I'll read you just this. Frederick Douglass told in his narrative how his condition as a slave became worse when his master underwent a religious conversion that allowed him to justify slavery as the punishment of the children of Ham. Mark Twain described his mother as a genuinely good person whose soft heart pitied even Satan, but who did not doubt the legitimacy of slavery because in years of living in antebellum Missouri, she had never heard in any sermon opposing slavery, but on only countless sermons preaching that slavery was God's will. With or without religion, Good people can behave well and bad people can do evil, but for good people to do evil, that takes religion. And that last line is a much quoted, uh, if you Google famous quotes of Steven Weinberg, you'll find that one. Um, okay, now on to the collaboration we had, and I hope you will give me uh, 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 the, the license to go through those slides. Uh, I'm going to uh, skip that. Um, I wanted to tell you, sort of, you know, greatest hits of his cosmology contributions, but time is too short. I will focus on the one that we collaborated on and the one that has an almost equal share in, in his review of this problem in 1989, the, uh, uh, in terms of his citation count, uh, almost equal to the citations of his lepton model paper. And that is his review of the cosmological constant problem. Um, which begins uh, with a poem by William Hugh Mearns, uh, Antigonish from 1899, yesterday upon the stair, I met a man who wasn't there. He wasn't there again today. Oh, how I wish he'd go away. And of course, I used that quote partly as a, an excuse to tell you that Weinberg was a great lover of poetry and uh, poetry readings including those uh, led by the uh, uh, members of the uh, Austin Poetry Society. Uh, but on to the cosmological constant problem. Um, I, I hope you'll give me a chance to go through these slides. This is sort of the meat of the scientific bullets that I wanted to share because this is a physics meeting. It's not just a, uh, a memoriam. Uh, so physics is something I wanted to share. Uh, before the discovery of Hubble expansion, Einstein uh, had added a term to his GR equations, r mu nu minus one half g mu nu r minus lambda g mu nu equals minus eight pi g t mu nu, where r mu nu and r are the Ricci tensor and scalar, t mu nu is the energy momentum tensor, g mu nu the metric tensor, and lambda is the cosmological constant, which he introduced so that a universe filled with non-relativistic matter of density rho could remain stable, sorry, static, even though not stable, if the cosmological constant were fortunate to be set at the value eight pi g rho. After expansion of the universe was discovered, or I should say the expansion of galaxies, Einstein wrote Weil in 1923, if there was no quasi-static world, then away with the cosmological term. He considered it inelegant. The problem Weinberg noted, however, is that anything that contributes vacuum energy density rho v behaves like a cosmological constant as Zeldovich had already suggested quantum fluctuations would do in 1967. Lorentz invariance requires that for a vacuum, the energy ten momentum tensor T mu nu must take the form T mu nu is proportional to G mu nu, it's equal to minus rho v, that's v for vacuum G mu nu which is equivalent to adding a term to lambda, thereby making an effective cosmological constant out of eight pi g rho v effective equal to lambda effective, where rho v effective, the effective total vacuum energy density is the sum of the 
cosmological constant term of Einstein plus the vacuum energy rho v, uh, which could in principle cancel each other out. However, if the a cosmological a constant effective without canceling out um, were too large, it would spoil the rough agreement between the universe we live in today and which we believe for so many years had no lambda and astronomical observations. Um, so if rho v effective is much bigger than the mass density of the universe that we can observe, in fact, the universe would have expanded exponentially fast, which it does not. Um, before the discovery, um, uh, okay. Um, now, the observed energy density of the universe is close to the critical density, which makes the curvature flat for the expansion rate measured today, if expressed by the Hubble constant we measure of 70 kilometers per second per megaparsec. Um, that is in Planck units, about 10 to the minus 23, or in physicist units with the h bar equals to the speed of light equals one, that's about 10 to the minus 47 times GeV to the fourth. The problem is that vacuum energy is expected to be much larger. For example, summing the zero point energies of all normal modes of some field of mass M up to a cutoff wave number K cut much bigger than the mass M gives um, rho V um, equal to about K to the fourth of the cutoff wave number over 16 pi squared. If we said that general relativity was correct all the way up to the Planck scale, then that cutoff scale would be one over the square root of eight pi G. And that would make the vacuum energy about 10 to the 71 in those units of GeV to the fourth. Um, in that case, we would need the lambda term uh, to cancel the vacuum energy term in the sum, leaving behind the effective vacuum energy uh, much smaller than rho crit. But to do that, it would have to cancel so perfectly that it would cancel to better than 118 decimal places. And that was the, the description of the cosmological constant problem, the worst inconsistency in the history of physics. Suppose instead we take an easier route, we say, well, let's not worry about energy scales higher than the known physics, for example, QCD. Um, one of the contributions that Steve made, I hope my colleagues talk about, uh, for which he is greatly credited, uh, is uh, effective quantum field theory. Um, and you could make a, an effective theory where you are still stuck with the highest energy scale of known physics, making a vacuum energy density of 10 to the minus six in those units. And it appears that we will have gained many, many, many orders of magnitude of success, um, unfortunately, um, that we are still required to uh, do the cancellation by 41 decimal places. Houston, we have a problem. So Weinberg actually welcomed the problem. Physics thrives on crisis, he said. Um, I, I wish I could read you the rest. I, I wanna speed it up so you can read while I talk. So he surveyed various proposed solutions in five categories. Super, one category, various solutions proposed in supersymmetry, supergravity, or superstrings. Another category of adjustment mechanisms involving the postulating of a, a certain scalar field with characteristics that would uh, deus ex machina take care of the cancellation. Um, the possibility of modifying gravity from general relativity, what he called quantum cosmology, by which he meant uh, in the language that Hawking was speaking of a uh, wave function for the universe. Uh, all interesting, none convincing, some fatally flawed, along with one more he had considered just the year before, which he called anthropic considerations. Weinberg in 87 had argued that since primordial density perturbations in a homogeneous universe require gravity to amplify them over time from their linear uh, beginning to nonlinear amplitude and collapse, then if galaxies exist, the vacuum energy density must be less than the maximum value um, that would be the value just large enough to offset gravity if the um, uh, and prevent galaxy formation if rho vacuum uh, were 
uh, for a uh, repulsive uh, positive cosmological constant, um, effective constant. An easy way to estimate what that value is for that upper limit that would halt collapse um, it comes from using GR to write a general relativistically correct modified Poisson equation in which the term that we're used to on the right-hand side involving matter density is replaced by matter density minus twice the vacuum energy density over the speed of light squared. And when we sum over the two types of components of mass energy, matter and vacuum energy, where the pressure for the vacuum energy is minus the uh, energy density, uh, this is what we get. So obviously we need to have this term positive. So we need to have rho V max at least a half rho matter C squared. But the truth is we have to do better than that in a flat expanding universe. We have to make sure the collapse of this expanding thing happens uh, by uh, the time the density is rho matter. So that boosts the number a bit. Now, Steve knew in 1987, quasars had already been discovered with redshifts higher than redshift four. And therefore, according to this criteria, um, the matter density being 125 times its value at a ratio of four when the universe was denser than it is today, that would mean that the um, cosmological constant could be any value all the way up to about 400 times its present mass density um, before it would squelch galaxy formation. So this was not great news for the anthropic likelihood argument, he thought since 400 is so much larger than one. And there was no particular anthropic reason that the, the uh, vacuum energy density had to be much smaller than that. It could have been anything between. And therefore it was a very um, weak predictive value, this anthropic argument. Now I have to tell you, the reason I'm going to go on is that at this moment, most of you are probably saying, huh, I didn't realize that when Steve was writing about it first, he was coming to a negative conclusion about the anthropic argument um, because we all um, know and give him uh, um, mileage for being a champion of it. Well, that came, that was yet to come. In fact, the cosmological constant problem was about to get worse, much worse. Um, the Cosmic Microwave Background Explorer, COBE satellite was launched by NASA in 1989 and to measure the cosmic microwave background and its anisotropy. Um, and the DMR instrument aboard, the, uh, the differential microwave radiometer aboard, COBE uh, uh, made the uh, um, Nobel Prize winning discovery uh, of the anisotropy of the otherwise extremely uniform cosmic microwave background by mapping it on the sky uh, uh, on angular scales uh, separated by more than uh, 10 degrees. So it's kind of a blurred version of the map, but blurred on the scale of 10 degrees and above. I mean, blurred on the scale of 10 degrees and below. And if you subtracted the effect of our uh, Doppler shift relative to the isotropic radiation background, you were left with an RMS uh, density, uh, I mean, temperature fluctuation of only 10 to the minus five as a part of the three relative to the three degree temperature of this black body. Oh my. Um, and it didn't, it measured more than that. It measured the amplitude and the scale invariant shape of the primordial density fluctuation power spectrum at large scales. And it said the universe was flat. And it, the universe to be flat, that means the sum of the densities in units of that critical density to make the universe flat, the fraction of contributing the critical density due to matter added to the contribution due to a cosmological constant or rho V added to the uh, curvature term had to be one. Um, and all of those predictions were consistent with cosmic inflation. Data kept rolling in uh, for the next few years by 1996, with more COBE data and additional experiments, the case for omega equals one was even stronger. Meanwhile, lines of evidence were gathering to suggest the observed matter density today has omega matter less than one. 
thereby putting the standard CDM model of that day, that was the standard CDM model, um, which assumed omega matter was one into crisis. Today, we don't think that's what CD, standard CDM means, but that's what it meant in 1996. But replacing standard uh, CDM with lambda CDM, the version that was flat, made flat by a cosmological constant, only makes the cosmological constant problem worse. Can't solve it now, even by finding a clever way to make the effective vacuum energy zero. Now we must explain why it is almost zero but not zero, and so close to the matter density today. Now we call it the new cosmological constant problem. The summer of 96, Weinberg was grappling with this new constant cosmological constant problem, referring to his 89 review as a litany of failed attempts. Something else of great interest, if only to me, happened then too. On May 28th, I became a father for the first time. One day, as I held my baby daughter, Sophia, helping her fall asleep after a bottle. The telephone rang in the kitchen, the days of a landline. It was Steve. He asked a question. This was a frequent, or I should say, not an unfamiliar thing. And when Steve called, I answered the phone. And when he asked the question, everything dropped for me to answer that question. It was very important to me to answer his questions. So I prayed that my daughter would not wake up while I was trying to listen to and answer Steve's question as I held her over my shoulder. How does one calculate the probability of forming galaxies in the cold dark matter model, he asked me. I told him I could answer that. And what if there was a, what if there was a cosmological constant? I told him that too, including the statistical nature of the process as the nonlinear outcome of Gaussian Rand Renoy's density perturbations. Remember, his 1987 paper only showed that if the cosmological, if the vacuum energy density roughly exceeded the mean matter density, when galaxies formed, collapse would be suppressed. And remember that this would have required the vacuum energy density to be greater than 400 times the mean energy density at the present. So this was not good for anthropic reasoning, uh, since any smaller value than that was just as likely and could be as close to zero as and, and make no difference. Well, what was wrong with this reasoning? Two things, and that's what prompted this collaboration to follow. It yeah, failed. Sorry, Paul, um, I don't mean to interrupt, but uh, we're um, over time now. So uh, are we almost done? I, I, will, uh, I will select a session. I yeah. will now selectively skip forward to, to make that happen. Okay, thank okay. you. All right. So the two points uh, are to realize that it was necessary to take account of the Gaussian random noise perturbations and what that process meant in structure formation. And uh, he had not done that before. In fact, he had not understood how to do that before. Uh, I knew how to do that. This is what the universe looks like when uh, linear perturbations grow forward in time, uh, making the matter become clumped and clustered. Um, and so from this, I did my best to calculate the answer for Steve based upon some notes that he gave me. And then with my postdoc, Ugo Martel, um, we sat down to uh, generate the answer for him. And for me, it was just, what I did with Steve. I mean, it was a reason to do it, even if I had to drop everything to do it. It was interesting, it was challenging, but I, it was Steve. So I was very pleased, but surprised when he said to me, well, what do you think? Should we publish this? And I said, well, sure. And um, out came this paper, likely values of the cosmological constant. Okay, so I have to fast forward because I'm out of time. Uh, but um, I want to tell you that we calculated the uh, anthropic likelihood um, of uh, the cosmological constant having a different value in uh, different sub-universes of a multiverse. Uh, and I don't have time to go into the justification from various ideas that were abundant at that time as to why we might live in a universe in which there are different regions or sub-regions 
that each unfold with their own cosmological constant. Um, and the necessity was to figure out um, what was the probability of R uh, being in one uh, with one value over another. Um, and the, uh, the end result, so let me fast forward, um, is uh, to say that in addition to calculating the probability, we then had to um, gather up all the observational constraints of the day um, that would have uh, restricted the value in our observed universe of the vacuum energy associated with the cosmological constant by um, assembling the observational constraints on the matter density parameter omega matter and the dimensionless Hubble constant, assuming that we lived in a flat lambda CDM universe. Um, and we did that. I don't have time to go over all these wonderful things, uh, but um, the, I'm getting to the bottom line. Um, the data suggested uh, that we should, we should find ourselves in a universe in which the cosmological constant was between 0.6 and 0.7 of the critical density, uh, vacuum energy uh, uh, roughly twice uh, the matter density, um, and um, the probability of being in such a universe uh, ourselves was between two and 5%. So um, if so, our anthropic likelihood calculation found that the probability of a, a random observer would find a value of this vacuum energy as small as this value in our own subuniverse would be in the range two to 5%, well below the median of the probability distribution, but it was broad, but high enough to make the anthropic likelihood explanation plausible. In, if future observations then confirmed this value for omega lambda, we concluded then the anthropic likelihood explanation for the cosmological constant problem is, is viable. This was our anthropic prediction, in fact, of Omega Lambda. Now I am going to skip to the end. Soon after the anthropic likelihood paper's publication in early 98, 1998, observations of luminosity distances of type 1a supernovae found the first evidence that cosmic expansion was accelerating and if so, that meant the cosmological constant had to be omega lambda greater than half omega matter. And soon after, also within a few more years, the CMB and isotropy measurements pushed to much higher angular resolution, determining the cosmological parameters to great precision, confirming flatness with, what do you know? Omega matter equals 0.3, omega lambda equals 0.7, and the Hubble parameter in dimensionless units 0.7. Our, our region of uh, what we said was where we expected it to be was, is now observed. And this is the last slide. Um, um, anthropic predictions seem to have been borne out. The anthropic likelihood explanation for the cosmological constant problem may be viable after all. Meanwhile, new ideas in particle theory seem to make the case for a multiverse stronger. For example, string theory evolved to predict the landscape. Perhaps this weak form of the anthropic principle is necessary after all, if so. Uh, and I will conclude now, Steve, forget the Alamo, remember Weinberg. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Shapiro. Um, I want to just let you know 